morning. It's Colossians 3, um, verse 11 on page 984, if you're using one of the black Bibles that are in the rows. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord. Every city has a story, and every storyteller a different form. Five pastors from five cities will share their stories through one verse, revealing that each one of us, from New York to Nashville to Memphis to Atlanta and to Tacoma, have one mission. How we doing? I swear these guys are messing with me. I have readjusted this thing every service. Is this some kind of game, huh? You want to play? You don't want to get me started. All right. Uh, my name is Leonce, and uh, I am the planning pastor for Renovation Church in downtown Atlanta. And uh, we've been there, uh, lived there for three years. The church launched publicly about eight months ago. And uh, we have really, really enjoyed God's grace. And I'm, I'm grateful for being here with you. Uh, Pastor Darren is a good friend. Uh, first time I met him, if I got time for this quick story. First time I met him, you know, when, when two big dudes come in a the room, they do the big dude thing. And, you know, you kind of size them up. And he kind of sized me up. And I was like, you don't want to do it, Doc. So, <laughs> and, uh, and so after we got over that part, we really got to know each other. He's been a great brother and a great mentor and, and, uh, and a great friend. So, uh, and I'm glad to call him that. A couple of rules for the road before we jump in. All right, I am, as you may plainly see with your eyes, an African-American pastor. So you're gonna have to talk this morning, all right? So I'm gonna give you a couple of things you can do. If it's good, you can say amen. If the gospel hitting you, you can do the deacon face. If it's tearing you up. If it's real good, you can do the deacon hum. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> and all of those are acceptable responses to the preaching of the Word. Now, I had one old lady in our church, if it's real good, she'll just stand up and wave. Now, if the Spirit moves you, don't be afraid to stand and wave. So as a little ruse for the road, we're going to get into this this morning, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. If you will pray for me, I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to jump right in, all right? Heavenly Father, you are good and gracious, kind and loving. You are merciful beyond measure. Your love is everlasting and inexhaustible. God, I pray this morning as we attempt to unfold the mysteries of the gospel uh, that you would set this man aside. God, I am unworthy uh, to open your scriptures, unworthy still to proclaim them, uh, and yet you've called me to do so. I pray this morning that we would be transformed by the preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, come, convict us, compel us, change us so that we leave this place differently than we came. And everybody said, amen. That was pretty weak. Now, I'm going to let it go. You know, we already talked about this. I don't want to have to get back into it. So, as I said, we, uh, we moved to Atlanta about three years ago to plant Renovation Church specifically for that purpose, parachuted into the city. Uh, didn't know anyone, didn't have any relationships. I had been there uh, in 04 for a little bit with the Falcons uh, before they booted me and I got picked up by the Saints. Uh, so I already had a bad taste for the city, but God sent me there anyway. And, <laughs> and we moved there uh, with the intention of planning a church that would reflect the glory of God. Uh, at the same time, uh, reconcile people not only to God, but back to one another. Uh, but what we realized very quickly after we got there is that there was going to be a lot of groundwork before we ever had a, had a public service take place because every city has a story. 
Every city has a history. And Atlanta's story and Atlanta's history is one that is uh, riddled with social and socioeconomic and racial strife and division. And, and, and so that history has totally impacted the present reality for our city. I'll give you an example. In 1975 or 6, uh, they elected the first African-American mayor in the city of Atlanta. It was Maynard Jackson. And so there was this big controversy and this big fallout because of it. And, and so all of the wealthy white elites said, okay, you keep the city, we'll take the money. And they moved out of Atlanta and started a new city called Buckhead. And to this day, that is where all of the wealth in Atlanta is concentrated. It's concentrated in Buckhead. You want a $75 steak, you go to Buckhead. I've never had one, but I heard they're amazing. And, <laughs> And that's where all the money is. I'll give you another example. Uh, the, the police force integrated in the early 60s. But even after that took place, the African-American police officers were not allowed to change into their uniforms at the police station. And so there's a, a, a very historic YMCA that I work out at called the Butler YMCA because that's where the officers used to have to change because it was still in the city, in their neighborhood. And so this is the story of Atlanta. As a matter of fact, the neighborhood that I live in, Grant Park, is, is about a quarter mile from where Dr. King grew up and where his father's church is. And though Dr. King had this dream uh, of, of a city and a people that was not divided by race and culture and creed and, and class division that created hostility, he dreamed of a world where people were united and woven into this beautiful tapestry that he called all God's children. That's where you say amen. <laughs> so we learn it, we learn it. We learned, y'all gonna be so messed up when Pastor Darren get back. Y'all gonna be talking to him. He was like, I'm trying to make my point here, guys. And y'all gonna be talking back to him. <laughs> but, but, but we're living, we're living now in, in, in the shadow of that. In, in the shadow of, of the birth of the civil rights movement. We live in a part of the city that, that has the heartbeat of what Dr. King longed for. He had a beautiful dream. It was a gospel dream. Just as Pastor Josh said, the, the dividing wall of hostility, the reason the sin of racism exists is because it's sin. And Dr. King's dream was one that would only be realized in the gospel. And so we chose our part of the city because of the opportunity it presented to live out the words that this country was supposed to be founded on. 1776, July 1776, these words were ratified by our forefathers. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. All men and women. I don't want nobody jumping me after service. <laughs> that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths, meaning we value them, we love them, we extend them to the world, and we uphold them. And these truths, they're self-evident, meaning that they don't need to be defined, they don't need to be measured. Their power is in the weight of the words themselves, that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights. They were created equal by their maker, not by a man. And the rights that they were given was by the one who formed them in his image. And they're inalienable rights, meaning that they can't be taken away by anyone else. 
nor can they be given away by the one who possesses them. Now, what is ironic about that is that these words were ratified in 1776, and if, if you look at history, then you know that by 1776, slavery had been going on for almost 100 years. What's ironic about that is these words were penned in 1776, but it would be another hundred years before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And still another hundred years of lawful oppression through Jim Crow and, and separate but equal and segregation. You see, the reality is that all men are created equal until we decide they're not. The reality is that all men are created equal until we decide that the distinctions are too great to overcome, too great to address, too massive to deal with. Now, some of you might be thinking right now, oh, but that was, that was so long ago, was it? A few months ago, I was walking home from our worship gathering in Grant Park, uh, and there's a guy running around the park, looking like John the Baptizer, big old long white beard. He was in violation, all white jumpsuit in the summertime just reflecting the sun, I'm like, and he's waving a Confederate flag in my neighborhood, talking about the South shall rise again. Well, besides speaking, God has given me a particular gift of sarcasm. <laughs> and, uh, and so I approached him with the intent of maybe eventually sharing the gospel with him. Uh, <laughs> And I said, uh, rise again, you say. Yeah. For what purpose? And he blathered on something about states' rights. And I said, would you like to see me in chains? And he just stared at me. And then I offered to buy him a razor and I moved on. But. The point is that we're not so far removed. It was just a few months ago that, that several uh, white teenagers in Mississippi got into their trucks at a party late one night and they drove to the quote, black side of town, what would be North City here in St. Louis. And, and they went looking for someone to hurt. They saw this African-American gentleman walking down the street and they hopped out of their vehicles and they beat him. And then they jumped back in their vehicles and the leader, F-250, ran over him, killed him. Then they went back to McDonald's to debrief. And the ringleader said, I went looking for an N-word tonight and I got me one. That was just a couple months ago. 2008, Sevierville, Tennessee, where I was pastoring, I was refused service at a pilot station. I went in to buy some gas cards for a, a young lady who, because I was over Mercy Ministry. And the lady said, I, I'm not going to serve your kind. And you know, that, that spiritual gift kicked in again. <laughs> and I said, what, tall people? And she said, you know. And I said, what? People with curly hair? And I just went through all these different, I, I, people with blue shirts. I mean, I just irritated the crap out of her as long as I could. Because <laughs> I wanted her to say it. Say it. Say what's on your mind. And eventually she just got mad, went to the office and slammed the door. So we are not so far removed from this reality, are we? 
if you lived in St. Louis for, for any amount of time, you know. No, family, the, the, the sin of racism and classism and divisions along socioeconomic lines is a reality. But the church is supposed to be different. The church is supposed to be the mirror to the world where the world looks in and sees what was always intended to be. We're supposed to reflect the kingdom that is coming. Paul says that at the start of Colossians chapter 3, that if you have been raised with Christ, if you've received the gospel, the good news that your righteousness has been traded for Christ's righteousness and you've been cleansed by the sacrificial blood of Jesus, if you have been raised with Christ, then you put off your old self. You put off your racism. You put off your classism. You put off your divisions. If you've been raised with Christ, verse 10 of chapter 3 says that you put on a new self. And here's the kicker. Here's the beauty of this. This new self is not simply a new person. It's not individualized. It's a new humanity. It's a recreation of what God always intended. O'Brien, a commentator, says that the renewal in verse 10 refers not simply to an individual change of character, but also to a corporate recreation of humanity itself in the Creator's image. Simply put, this is bigger than you. If you've been raised with Christ, this is bigger than you. This is about the kingdom of God. And what that means is for anyone who would say with confidence that Jesus is Lord, racism, classism, and artificial distinctions are not an option. They're not an option. They're not an option any longer because we've been made into a new people. When we moved to Atlanta and started conceptualizing what a church would look like and, 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 and who we were trying to reach, I, I, I came up with this word. That's what pastors do if you don't know. When, when we have an idea, but there's not a word for it, we make up one. It, it's allowed by Webster's, I think. No. Uh, and, and we made up, I, I made up this word, new ethnics. You know, the ethnos of something is the culture and the atmosphere that it creates. The definition of a people is its ethnos. And so we said that, that we want to be new ethnics a new people all together because that's what the Bible describes. And we defined it this way. We become new ethnics when we come to follow Jesus and are transformed by the gospel. We are striving to be freed from the bounds, the chains of prejudice, fear, and hangups of simply being identified by our race, class, or culture. We long to become a new race altogether, a beautiful tapestry of God's creation, called and chosen by Him for something bigger than ourselves. As such, we are deeply committed to being intentionally transcultural. Now, this is my dream for our church, for my city. And I hope it's your dream for, for the journey and for St. Louis that people would not be defined by what high school they went to. Oh, I know. I asked some questions. 
that people would not be defined by living in North City where I know the majority of the poverty and the minorities are. West County where all of the wealth is. 16 year olds driving Lexuses. I want a Lexus. Shoot. I'm piled up in a Corolla. These are the divisions in your city. In mine, the wealth is in Buckhead. Everything wealthy is north and east, wealthy and white. And everything broken is south and west. What is the church's role in seeing these divisions eliminated? This is my dream. Is it yours? Because the church is supposed to be different, but unfortunately, historically, it hasn't been. Dr. King said that Sunday morning is the most segregated day of the week. What a shame. What a shame. Lemuel Haynes, a, a, a black freed man in the 1700s, who was a pastor and a Puritan and an abolitionist wrote that, that no man can be denied freedom or communion because of race or appearance. At the coming of Christ, when the Son of Righteousness arose, this wall of partition was broken down, meaning every Christian is equal and every Christian is family. But that doesn't happen overnight. It takes intentionality. It takes a knowing. You know, before we came here uh, to Atlanta, that same place, Sevierville, I lived in as one of six African Americans in the whole county. Uh, I had to get to know my congregation. I was in an all white church, large church all-white congregation. And I remember preaching every week, and nothing was hidden. They just staring at me. <laughs> and I go home, and I'm like, nah, no, I threw down that mother day. <laughs> and they ain't saying nothing. We weren't connecting. I was talking about homie the clown. I was talking about Tommy not having no job. I, you know. I was talking about the Waynes brothers, you know, we're brothers, you know, was, and they just weren't getting it. All of my illustrations fell dead, and I realized it's because I don't know these people, and they don't know me. We're miles apart. I grew up in the city, listening to Master P, sagging my pants, and running from bullets, and they grew up in the country listening to Kenny Chesney, thinking their tractors were sexy, <laughs> and running from bullets. So we met common ground there. We met some common ground right there. But we, we were miles apart. And so you know what I did? I suffered for the gospel, and I began watching bad television. <laughs> that was my sacrifice. And so I watched Reba. <laughs> I watched Full House, <laughs> Friends, which was mildly entertaining, <laughs> Seinfeld, and the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. And I started watching it regularly. And after a while, you know, my illustrations would change. And so I'm sitting there preaching on something, and I'd be like, and that's why they call me Tater. And they'd be like, ah, ha, ha, they fall out laughing. <laughs> and then I put the gospel in there, like, man, that's the best sermon I ever heard, Pastor. And I'm like, well, I guess we're on the same page now. <laughs> there takes a knowing and intentionality in creating this new humanity in seeing this gospel dream take place and take shape 
and form. So let me ask you, how do you see yourself? How do you define yourself? Is the first identifier you use when you see other people racial, cultural, ethnic, class-oriented? Are you a black man first or a son of the living God? Are you white first or redeemed by grace? Are you Asian American first or reconciled to the Father? What is the chief identifier, educated, uneducated, or redeemed? How do you define yourself, family? Because until we, in the community of Christ, begin to reflect the ethics of the community of Christ, there will never be new ethnics out in the world. That's what Paul challenges us to here in Colossians 3, 11. First he says here, okay, but where's here? It's a random way to start a verse, here. Where's here? Here is in the new humanity where we are being made in the image of Christ where the renovating work of the gospel is remaking our minds and our hearts to think, feel, see, speak, and live as Jesus did. Here where Christ is our life and Christ is our person and Christ is our meaning and Christ is our power and Christ is our passion because Christ is our everything. Here. In the new humanity, where Christ and Him crucified is the paradigm by which we live. Here, we are defined chiefly and only by the work of our resurrected Savior. Here, in the new humanity. And then Paul goes on to, to destroy. I love it. I read sarcasm into everything, so I'm, I'm thinking he's writing this sarcastically. <laughs> destroy all of these distinctions. He says here, there's no Greek or Jew. So what is he, what is he upending? Ethnic pride. Ethnic pride. You know, in case y'all didn't know, Jesus was a Jew. And so Christianity came to the Jews first, and they loved it just like they loved the law. And so they wanted to make sure that all these crazy Gentiles who Paul was seeing saved all over the place became good and Jewish before they became good and Christian. That's what religious folk like to do. Fix you before you meet Jesus. You know who you are. Huh. <laughs> And so Paul said, not here. There's no ethnic pride here. Everywhere that there was a church in the Near East in the first century, there was, and there was a large Jewish contingency, there was strife. As a matter of fact, you look back in Galatians, Paul had to come in and tighten Peter up. Y'all know that tighten him up had meant to compel him to rightly align his life with the renovating work of the gospel and the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he had to come in and tighten him up. Y'all go back and use that in, in your community groups. He had to tighten him up because Peter would eat with the Gentiles when other Jewish Christians weren't around. But then when other Jewish Christians came into town, he's like, oh man, I don't know them. Try to shine on somebody. That's how you get slapped. Try to shine on me. <laughs> and so, so Paul came in and Paul tightened him up. And Peter was older than Paul and an apostle longer than Paul. But Paul was like, hey doc, not here. Not in new humanity. That's not what Jesus showed you. What you know about Jesus, man? He blinded me on the road, son. 
you know. <laughs> Paul came and tightened them up because there's no ethnic pride here. There's no nationalism here. The biggest fight I have in the South is convincing people that God is not a white man wearing a red cape riding an elephant. There's no nationalism here in the new humanity. Republican. I knew a couple of y'all got it. There's no nationalism here. It's not primary. There's no ethnic pride here. This is what the gospel does. God has wrecked me with this to tell me that I'm a son of God first. I'm a husband second. I'm a father third. I'm a neighbor fourth. I'm a black man last. Amen. That's not an easy transition. And it doesn't always work out well. You know, when I saw that story about what happened in Mississippi, my first reaction wasn't to pray. Some old things started rising up, but you know, Holy Spirit good taking care of that. Here, there's no ethnic pride. Your ethnic distinctions fade at the foot of the cross. Paul goes on to say that uh, circumcised or uncircumcised, not here, not in the new humanity. You see, that was a distinction of religious heritage. That was a distinction of religious heritage that he, was, that he was just chopping it up and putting work on. It doesn't matter who your mama is, who your daddy is, how long you've been in church. That's what he was saying to the Jews. Your religious heritage, your laws and your feasts and your festivals, they're not primary here. Christ is all. Christ is in all. That's all that matters. Now, for some of you folks, you, you may be here this morning and, and you're still trying to figure the Jesus thing out. You need to hear this because your temptation will be to come and try to morally live up to some standard that you think Christians are living up to and, and, and look back at your religious heritage or the lack thereof and think that you've got to bring that in in order to be acceptable to God. No, sir, no, ma'am. Christ and him crucified. Here in the new humanity, your religious heritage, it doesn't matter. Paul goes on to the next distinction, and it's one of class, culture, and standing. You see, the term barbarian came from Greek derision of how people who weren't Greek spoke. They didn't feel that they spoke with the same eloquence as the Greeks did. And so they said that, that non-Greek people will walk around just going bar, 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 bar. <laughs> True story. But look it up. And so they started calling them barbarians because that's what they said their, their speech sounded like. Bar, 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 bar. Womp, womp. You know. That was it. And then the Scythian people were said to be the rowdiest, most uncivilized, tattooed, crazy haired looking folk that you've ever seen in your life. That's what the Romans described them as. Completely uncivilized. So there were class distinctions. You're a barbarian. You're uncivilized. Paul said, not here, not in the new humanity. Those things don't matter. The last one that he addresses, he says that here, there's no slave and no free. Now hear me, this is not Paul condoning slavery. Don't start stretching the text past what it gives you. What he's saying is your position in society, in the new humanity, it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter if you got a pass to the country club or a pass to get on the bus at the foot of the cross. You stand equal. You stand equal. You stand equal in the new humanity. So let me ask you again, what does your social circle look like? How many friends, true friends, do you have that are far down the social and societal and economic ladder from you? Not projects, not people you're trying to fix. Friends. You know, we got an unspoken rule at our church that you don't, you don't throw money at homeless dudes. You invite them to lunch. You ask them their story because they were made in the image of God. They were made in the image of God. And but for grace, there go I. What do your friends look like? What does your social circle look like? You know, we've had a large influx of young white professionals into the city and into our church. And so I see them coming every week and they're bringing other young white professionals to church, but they live on, on a block that's 90% African-American and Hispanic. I'm like, why are you not inviting them folk to church? Oh, well, pastor, we didn't know what to say to them. Start with hi, <laughs> follow with my name is, and your name, and then maybe dinner. And you know what? 100% of the time they'll come. They'll come. Because people are people. Here in the new humanity, all of the artificial distinctions that, that we've created for ourselves and for other people, they don't matter. They fade. The thought is clearly that the gospel in the new humanity makes these things irrelevant. So, you know, my dude, Matty, that's not my white homeboy. That's just my dude, Dr. Evil, bald head, glasses, that's what we call him. And my boy, Big Steve, that's just Big Steve. That's not my black homeboy. And my girl, Bianca, she's not my Hispanic homegirl. That's just Bianca. That's my sister in Christ. Because when we enter the new humanity, all of the created distinctions fade. Now, uh, somebody challenged me on this once when I, was, when, when I was talking about this idea, this insanity. And they said, what about my heritage? Does my heritage not matter? And I said, no, it matters. It matters in two ways. First, we're not talking about assimilation here. Okay, assimilation and new humanity are two different things. Assimilation is when everybody becomes the same. Okay, you're not gonna catch me in no boat shoes and short khaki shorts and braided belt. That's not how I roll. That's just not what I do. You know, my boy Adam Blakely, you see eight inches of leg hair <laughs> on everything he wears every week. Because that's his culture. Brother's got a, he's a scratch golfer, grew up in the burbs, grew up wealthy. And that's how they roll. Nice little part, we call him JFK. That's what he looks like. <laughs> that's my dude. But I don't want him to become like me. You know, I, I mean, really, I'm like some kind of weird pseudo-thug hipster. I don't know what I am. So he can't be me, and I don't want to become him. That's assimilation. The new humanity is a woven tapestry, and everything that is beautiful and Christ-exalting and God-honoring and life-giving from my heritage, I bring it to the new humanity to beautify it. And whatever isn't, we cut away. But even still, it's not primary. 
It's not primary. Why? Well, Paul answers it at the end of the verse there. Because Christ is all and in all. Christ is all. Even though those things are wonderful, they're not primary because Christ is all and in all. The great Christ hymn from Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20 tells us that he is the image of the invisible God, the unifier and reconciler of all things, the conqueror through his cross and the savior through his suffering. He's everything. And if he's everything, then nothing else matters. Nothing else matters matters. Christ is all and in all, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. You know, Peter, who was called out by Paul for being a racist in Galatians and called out by Jesus in Acts for trying to hold on to his religious heritage, wrote in 2 Peter, to a group of dispersed Christians all over what is now modern-day Turkey of various backgrounds, Jew and Gentile, various people groups even within those two distinctions. He wrote to them that you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people in Christ, God's people. He called them a new race, a new nation, a new people. He basically called them new ethnics. Now, lest you think I'm standing on my soapbox and telling you what it is, let me tell you how this comes home to me. You see, growing up in South Louisiana, I experienced all kind of racism. All kind of racism. I remember eight years old going to my dad's work party and, and, and one of his co-worker's sons calling me the N-word. Uh, and after I knife chopped him in the throat, <laughs> throat, my dad pulled me aside and said, son, you don't knife chop people in the throat. But you notice he did it afterwards, not before. <laughs> and, and I remember walking to the bus stop, and these guys pull up in this big jacked up truck, rebel flags flying, and they chuck a dip bottle out at me and hit me in the head. And all of these series of events, I mean, there's many, many more stories. We just don't have time. But all these series of events, they, they began to harden my heart make me angry and hateful. So much so that my own mom, who grew up in segregation, grew up in separate but equal, whatever that means, told me that I'd become what I hated. I'd become a racist. And you know, I wasn't trying to hear that at all. I said, what you talking about? Black folk can't be racist. She's like, oh, you're racist. I said, why do you, she said, why do you hate our neighbor? I don't like no white boys. That's called racism, son. <laughs> and, and so I just developed this hatred. And of course, God in his sovereignty sends Tom Cruise's cut out twin to come and share the gospel with me. Talking a mile a minute, he must have shared the gospel with me 50 times in 10 seconds. <laughs> you see, God came, to, came for your sins and he died for you and, and he wants to love you. And I'm like, but get out of my face. Get out. You know, <laughs> just trying to get him off me. And he just owned me. And so finally, he said, would you come to my youth group? And I said, if you never, ever, 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 ever come over here again, ever, don't ever talk to me, don't look at me, because we were neighbors. I will come to your youth group. And so I went. And that night, I came, showed up looking crazy. 
blue wind pants, blue Chuck Taylors, one leg pulled up on wind pants, <laughs> big old polo shirt, standing in the back looking mad, like this. And Pastor Adam McCain, youth pastor, man, he was hammering the gospel that night. Jesus gave himself for us freely. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do anything to get it. He just gives it. And I'm standing there, and I just start crying. Like, oh, oh, oh. You know, when big people cry, it's ugly. It's ugly. <laughs> and, uh, and he looking at Judah, standing next to me. He's like, he looking at me like that. And so I turned to him, what's happening to me? He's like, it's the Holy Spirit, man. He's got you. You know. <laughs> And like, what do I do now? He's like, well, you ask Jesus to come and save you, but he's doing it. I mean, this guy was, leave it to Beaver. And, and I love him, and I love him to this day. And, and God wrecked me, and he saved me. And so he began to mend my heart of all of those, those racist, hateful feelings that I had. But there were remnants that, that still affected how I thought and how I lived and how I felt about things uh, and still came out in strange ways. Like, for instance, I got to college and, uh, and I did all right that first year, you know, served God faithfully, but then, then I went into rebellion mode. Uh, and, and I went, wow. And, and went on a full sprint away from God until he finally, you know, God put the smack down. If you his, he gonna have you. And no matter how far, how fast you run, he will have you. And he had me, and he snatched me. And, and uh, but during that time, uh, you know, I had partied a lot, dated a lot, and even though I toyed with the idea, I never really seriously dated anybody outside of my race. Uh, Cause I, I still thought it was taboo. Those remnants were still there. And, uh, and so after that experience, I took a two-year dating hiatus. I didn't date nobody. Uh, and and uh, everybody was trying to hook me up with everybody. They thought I had got weird. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm just trying to get to know Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus can't cook. I'm like, well. <laughs> That's what my boys told me. So during this time, I'm making this list. You know, I got this list. 37 things I wanted in a wife. 37. You know, we set up a formal in interview process, three-part process. Um, and, and, and I write out this list, musically gifted, loves God, loves sports, loves children, wants to adopt, can cook, just long list thing. And number 37 was beautiful black woman. Things, you know, because I, I just thought that's the way it had to be. And then I met my wife, Brianna. Uh, who is beautiful and a woman. Uh, Nary is she black. And, uh, and we started hanging out a little bit. I remember the first time I saw her, she was worshiping. And I was like, ooh we like the way you worship. You know, that's, that's the Christian way of noticing a girl from afar. Man, she is going after God? Oh. You know. And so I went home and I told my old man, I was like, man, listen, I think I met the girl tonight that, that I might marry. He's like, boy, you crazy, up. <laughs> and we just laughed it off. And, and, and then, you know, over time, we really started, we started pursuing those, you know. She found out I was interested. She was interested, you know, I mean. <laughs> and uh, and so, so we started kicking it. And, uh, and halfway in between, I started getting apprehensive. You know, I was already in ministry. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to preach the gospel. I had homeboys who had done the interracial thing, and it was like, you know, it was hard because they wasn't black enough for the black church, and they was too black for the white church, and, and it was never really a fit, and I didn't want to deal with that. And I, I was like, how am I going to raise my kids? You know, they're going to go through crazy stuff, crazy identity stuff, and I didn't want to deal with that. Uh, and, and, and so I'm going through all of this turmoil. I'm getting ready to break up with her. And I go to my mom's and I say, you know, I'm, I got a bit of a conundrum here, mom. And, uh, and I tell her. And, and meanwhile, you know, Brianna's just, she's killing the list. I mean, she's 
Bow. She can cook. Bow. She loved Jesus. Bow. She loved basketball. Bow. She loved football. I mean, she's just, you know, she was interesting. We laugh at people. You know, you ever people watch with your wife and laugh at people? It's a fun game. And, uh, and so I'm like, man, she just hitting it. And I tell my mom about this, and I tell her about the list. She tells me I'm crazy for making the list. And, uh, and then I never forget what she said to me. She said, when, when you start trusting Jesus, son, number 37 won't matter so much, will it? And I was like, <laughs> hate you. Because <laughs> she was right. The fruit of the gospel doesn't allow for me to decide whether this woman's marriable because we got different cultural and racial backgrounds. And so it messed me up, messed me up bad. And so one day I'm gonna break up with her, the next day I'm not gonna break up with her. One day I'm gonna break up with her, the next day I'm not gonna break up with her. Well, here we are, half a decade of marriage, two beautiful children, and every single day, every single day, I get to experience the gospel fresh again as it washes over my heart, teaches me how to know and love my wife, even though we are very, very different people from very, very different backgrounds. I mean, not only is she white, she's from California, <laughs> which is like a nation unto itself. And so we, you know, we have these little things. She's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make some apple pie. And I was like, I want sweet potato pie. She said, I don't know how to make sweet potato pie. I was like, you better learn how to make sweet potato pie. <laughs> I ain't eating no apple pie. She can braid hair, though. She can braid hair. She, she used to braid me up when I had my cornrows. And, you know, so she's learning. You know, she's learning. And, and, and I've eaten asparagus. And so uh, we, there, there are concessions on both sides. Uh, but, but every day, Every day I get to enjoy the fruit of the gospel over and over and over again. But it took repentance and it took wrestling, wrestling with God about the corners of my heart that I was refusing to relent to the renovating work of the Holy Spirit. It took work and it took time. And now every day we live together in this idea of new ethnics. And it's beautiful and it's infecting our church. And, and, and our hope, our prayer, our goal is to see it affect our city. You see, just like St. Louis, we have pockets of wealth concentrated one place, pockets of poverty concentrated another. All the well-to-do churches are in one place, and all the, the nine and eight and seven people with, with one pastor who've been there 50 years just trying to make it happen with no money are in one place. What would it look like if 10, 15, 20 of y'all moved to North City and started living and loving like Jesus? kingdom would come. The kingdom would come. And this viral spread of, of gospel and grace in shaping new ethnics and tearing down the walls of hostility between people and God, the reconciling work of the Spirit, and between people and one another, the reconciling work of the Spirit, it would become a reality. And St. Louis would be different. St. Louis would be different. But it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us. Where does repentance need to take place, family? Where are the corners and pockets of your heart that you have refused to give to God? You refuse to relent. And so racism and prejudice and classism and divide and distinction still exist in your framework, in your worldview? Will you let the gospel arrest it this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your love. Father God, I pray that, that we have been face to face this morning with the living God. 
Holy Spirit, would you come and convict us, compel us by grace to repent of the ways that we have lived abject to the gospel, the ways that we have chosen to to not relent, the pockets of our heart that need to experience repentance. Holy Spirit, would you come now? Have your way with us. In Christ's name, amen.